Uh, it takes us a few days to get up there, but just wanted to give you a uh, give you a heads up. Um, so, so with that, with that in, let's go ahead and get started. Um, I think first, what I'd like to do is just introduce you to our, our panelists that we have today. Um, so first is Richard May. Uh, Richard is the strategic placement leader in Epic uh, within their national cyber, uh, cyber practice. Epic is a unique and innovative benefits insurance brokerage and consulting firm, and they're headquartered uh, down in San Francisco. Welcome, Richard. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, next, we have Richard Stainings. Uh, Richard is the chief security strategist at Solera. Solera is a next generation healthcare uh, IoT, cybersecurity, and intelligence company. Uh, and they were built in close partnerships with hospitals for hospitals. Uh, welcome, Richard. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Yeah, and, and to keep uh, what, what I'll say is Richard M. and Richard S. That way uh, <laughs> you, you know who I'm, I'm talking to. Um, and, and, and rounding on our panel today and, and providing a, the, the provider's perspective is, is Brian Caddy, uh, who's head of the information security strategy and architecture over at Providence St. Joseph's Health. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Providence is one of the largest provider organizations in the United States. I was looking at your stats 120,000 employees, 1,000 clinics, 50 hospitals in seven states. So uh, quite the footprint. Uh, welcome, Brian. Thank you, and good afternoon. And uh, my name is Dylan Strecker. I'm your host. I'm president of the Washington Hymns chapter. And when I am not hosting webinars in the afternoon for Hymns, I, I spend my days as a advisory solutions director over at Lumeris, which is a, a population health company based out of St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, thank you for all for joining today, and uh, let's go ahead and jump in. So uh, what we do is we, we send out surveys to our, uh, our members, and what we like to do is we, we like to get questions from our members and asking them, um, what are the things you're interested in, what are you, what are you talking about? And this month's survey was really focusing around you know, cybersecurity. And there, what ended up kind of surfacing the most, right, in, in those member questions were uh, really questions around uh, ransomware. Um, and, and to give a little bit of kind of a background and prep to those on the call, um, we we're doing a little, I was doing a bit of research and uh, I came across this recent study from Comparatech, that's a technology research firm, and they estimated that uh, U.S. healthcare organizations uh, have been hit with uh, almost 200 ransomware attacks. And, and costing around 150 to 160 million dollars in combined ransoms and downtimes since 2016 alone. Uh, we know here that in Washington, you know, roughly half a million of Washingtonians have, you know, either had their medical records compromised, or or cost our health systems, uh, you know, nearly nearly four million dollars. Right, as, as we think about some of the the recent attacks, uh, most of everybody on the line or our panel is probably familiar with the Grays Harbor Community Hospital out on the peninsula, right, where the ransomware, you know, you know, ransomware and the attackers, you know, demanded a uh, million dollars to unlock the, the patient files. We've even seen uh, earlier this year, a, a hacker group called Maze attacked a, a Bellevue-based plastic surgeon, right? All, and when ultimately, they ended up uh, publishing, you know, the, the patient data anyway, right? And, you know, uh, so what's interesting is we're, we're seeing these kinds of attacks you know, happening, and I think we're seeing them on the rise. So, you know, w one of our first questions for the panelists, and this is one is to, to Richard S., you know, can just give us a background. What is ransomware and, and how do organizations get infected? Yeah, so ransomware is a form of extortion, right? I mean, it's the modern day equivalent of, you know, <clears throat> the uh, paying uh, protection money um, to the local gang to stop your windows being smashed, right? Except this is being executed from you know, normally from other countries where the long hand of the law doesn't reach and there's no extradition treaties. So even when attribution is actually uh, um, attained, it's very difficult to prosecute those individuals, the perpetrators that are executing those crimes. Essentially, malware is somehow managed to, to be uh, <clears throat> pulled into the, uh, into the inside network and uh, that malware sets uh, a foot to encrypt uh, systems uh, on the healthcare network. Uh, it often spreads laterally, very quietly, um, across the uh, network looking to uh, maximize its footprint. Um, it then encrypts data and systems and then holds those systems uh, to ransom. And if we look at you know, the, the traits in ransomware, as you mentioned earlier, Dylan, 
you know, this has been an, an ongoing issue. Well, actually, ransomware started, you know, back in 1989, if I remember correctly. But it's been a big issue in healthcare um, for the last uh, last five years or more. And perhaps a, a good example of that is, uh, from an impact perspective, is what happened to the British NHS, where a large number of hospitals were forced to close because their IT systems uh, were no longer operable and patients had to be diverted, uh, operations had to be cancelled, procedures had to be cancelled. Um, so there is, you know, there is a, a major impact to healthcare above and beyond just the, the payment of uh, a ransom in Bitcoin to, uh, to the perpetrators uh, of, of a crime. Yeah, yeah, thanks for, thanks for that. And, I, you know, as kind of a follow-up as, as we think about that, what you know, I think everybody's getting it right, familiar kind of with the concept of it, but, uh, you know, when kind of when you get under the hood, what, what are the technical solutions that, that folks are, that, that organizations are deploying, right, to kind of prevent against that? So like all things in security, um, it needs to be a, a combination of people, process, and technology. Okay. Uh, we look at how uh, perpetrators are getting their malware onto, onto networks, right, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the code, uh, either the, the uh, encryption code um, or a download agent that essentially uh, a dropper, as we call it in the space, that essentially pulls down data from a, uh, a command and control server or one of the proxy servers that work for those C2 servers. Um, then most of the infiltration of that initial dropper is via human areas through a process of phishing um, with uh, malicious attachments in email, um, Acrobat. Uh, uh, attachments for PDF attachments, for example, um, or other forms of attachment, um, or through users inadvertently clicking on a uh, on a web link that takes them to a malicious page where their uh, a dropper may be uh, you know, automatically loaded to to their system. So we need to at first, you know, we need to spend a lot more money, time, and effort on training our users to think very carefully before they they click on links or before they open attachments even if those attachments appear to come from someone they know and trust, right? Um, are they expecting that sort of attachment? Is this a file that uh, they would normally receive? Those sorts of things. And we can do that with uh, security awareness training and with constant testing. Um, statistics show uh, in hospitals, and several of my colleagues uh, that uh, run security in, in various hospitals have got statistics that prove this point, that when you have an ongoing security awareness program, the click rate declines drastically. The minute that that uh, program stops, if it's a, you know, an annual test or something like that, the click rate goes back up. So this is a simple, easy way to stop perpetrators in their track by uh, essentially training our people um, to avoid that type of uh, activity. Secondly, I think there are you know, technical controls and policy controls, policy obviously around enforcing uh, adherence to security policy about not going to malicious sites or not going to high risk sites, but technical controls around, you know, our email and our, and our, our web technology. Can we put in place sandboxing, for example, which is a very good mechanism to open attachments in a virtual machine such that if that uh, attachment is malicious, it's contained in that virtual machine, which is then subsequently destroyed. The same with web pages, right? If you do sandbox uh, web pages, uh, then uh, again, if there is any malicious attachment, it's contained within that virtual machine and can't spread laterally across the, the network. Secondly, I think we can put in place, you know, more micro segmentation of our healthcare networks, which were designed to be flat uh, and provide access uh, from any legitimate authorized uh, user to anything at any time, anywhere on the network. And we need to start going back and retrofitting those networks so that we can contain outbreaks to a limited number of machines rather than having that um, uh, malware essentially spread throughout the network and causing an interruption to services. Uh, we can look at the types of security we have around our email using you know, DMARC, SPF, PKIM email security or in ensuring that you know, our users can only uh, connect with us, uh, our patients in other words, can only connect with us via uh, an official SSL uh, email gateway where we can scan um, attachments or, uh, or scan messages. And we also need real-time alerting uh, against indicators of compromise, 24 by seven SOCs, um, or managed detection and response services, or managed security uh, services 
to provide us that eyes on glass to let us know when something um, hinky, for want of a better word, is going on on our network so we can respond quickly. Most of these attacks um, uh, happen over a long period of time and it's just the fact that we don't have sufficient eyes on glass to know what's happening, right? Yeah, no, that's uh, you know, a lot of a lot of great points there. And, and as, as I think about it, right, um, you know, I think when I was in, introducing uh, Brian earlier, right, you have, you know, uh, a few hundred thousand employees, a thousand care sites, right? You, you, you multiple, you know, multiply that by two X or three X because you have mobile devices that folks are for bringing in, you know, I'm, Brian, when I when I kind of this question's for you, but you know, from a provider's perspective, right, and kind of listening to kind of, you know, what, what Richard S. was talking about, I mean, you know, are hospitals investing in that or, or, or where are you guys investing in, in, in purchasing different types of products or how are you training your staff to, you know, prevent these types of attacks? Well, the first step is is making sure that there's a good understanding across the board that of this very the problem. Yeah. Um, and that's one of those things, like I said, just to, because right now we're all dealing with tight with really tight budgets, uh, with limited funds. Um, a lot of the solutions, Richard did a great job of, of explaining what a lot of those would be and and what the approach is. But a, a, hu a significant part of the, I know this, the FBI Cyber Shield Alliance is, has some stats, some information on the increase that's happened just since the the the, the COVID. Uh, pandemic is, has occurred as well as um, I know Verizon has their uh, uh, the data breach investigation report the DBIR that for 2020 that just came out and so they're all showing that yes this is this is a serious a severe problem it's getting it's only getting worse and it is significantly you know it is something that is going through and, and growing so a lot of what we're doing is um, like Richard said, we're working on making sure that we have, since the, the number one way, to, the easiest way to get something into an environment is through email. So providing a solid email solution that does go through and provide sandboxing of links, provide sandboxing of applications going through and setting that up for us. That's a, a, a huge, that's critically important to go through and do that. And then um, going through and, and doing the training, the, the individual training. So we have, we contract with the training solution. So when we do our testing, it's important to do testing for going through and, and check, making sure that the employees know what to click on, what not to click on. Um, because, you know, it's a really, it's a very low risk to find the people who are most likely to, to, to go through and click on the wrong thing. And we have that constantly rotating through. And then if somebody clicks on something they shouldn't, they're automatically enrolled in a course to help go through. And, <laughs> and yeah, it, it's not a, it's not a punishment. It's, it's, not, it's not a trap. No, <laughs> it's not a trap. No. But it, it does help go through and reduce risk. We'll say rates of recidivism go down considerably. If yeah. You, You've hit that once or twice, um, but when it comes down to dealing with it, it, it really come it it gets to like everything in security. There's prevention, there's detection, and there's correction. There's correction of that. Okay. So um, we're dealing with, like I said, a lot of the email solutions and and sandboxing as well. Um, one of the most important things is deal is setting up a uh, the firewall correctly. I've had some very spirited discussions on whether or not the uh, the there is still a, bear, a a an edge essentially in IT and I believe it's important to to try to have a perimeter. Uh, but one of the things that's important is not only to go through and set that up to block a lot of external attackers, but also to block from the inside. So we've got our setup. So if we just if a known exploiter, if we there's if, so one of the common um, uh, malware attacks comes in, we have our firewall set up so that you cannot get back out because most of the time, that way we can, if something happens, it can be detected and corrected before it actually goes through and um, and goes through and does any encryption of the systems. Um, the other is, so like I said, setting up the firewall for, for not only inbound, but like I said, to protect from outbound is critically important for for dealing with with the different types of... Uh, so so okay. what you would... And, and I just want to clarify. So what you mean is that if, um, you know, if you have a user that clicks on something, right, it, I understand the sandbox, but what it does is it, it's fact it, you, you, what you're doing is you're, you're locking them out from accessing the rest of the system once they've infected themselves. Is that right? 
Actually, it's, it's locking them out. There is endpoint detection response, which does do that. And that's something okay. we're working with, but it's locking them out from being able to phone the system from being able to phone home to its, um, to the control server. So Got when it. somebody gets hit with, with some type, with this type of attack frequently, yeah. um, it will go through and the ransomware you frequently phones home before it encrypts the system and does that. So we're locking them from being able to do that. So um, what it comes down to is like so many things involving security, it's, it's defense in depth or layers yeah. of security. And that's an important factor because like I said, it's, you can't, it, we are big enough. We're large enough where we've gotten test case zero for, for multiple attacks. Um, similarly, it's interesting because some of the, we, if, if folks have not joined the, uh, the um, cyber shield, the FBI cyber shield group, that's something that's a, uh, a, a good, a good group to go through and get a lot of information from. But um, we've had attacks where we've actually notified the FBI of things that we've seen and had been able to go through and, you know, th they've been very good about setting up meetings where we've met with multiple field offices to provide the information where something is going through and taking another step. And that's what we've kind of noticed since the whole COVID pandemic has occurred. It's the, the volume has increased a little bit, but the, the types of attacks have, have grown and incre increased in complexity. And there've been a couple, like I said, there've been cases where we've been able to go through and share that with other groups, as well as, like I said, with law enforcement to go through and hopefully prevent that. Um, in addition to some of the things I've mentioned with that, uh, going with segmentation. Uh, micro segmentation is very difficult to do at scale, but at least have macro segmentation so your your servers are not on the same network as your workstations because most of these attacks are gonna hit workstations. Um, and it's great if you can isolate it to that one machine, but at least make sure that your your patient health information, your employee data, is is protected and is on a different segment. Um, and point detection response is also an area where we've we've gone through and really expanded over the last year. And that's been a, a huge benefit for making sure that we can shut things down very, very quickly and have the data to go through and do that. And as a last resort, one of the things just to keep in mind is, I, yeah, because you'd never know if you pay uh, the, uh, the, the ransom, if they're going to go through and really provide yeah. the, key, the keys yeah, or if they're going to release the data anyways, anything along those lines. Um, so with us, we, like I said, our goal, we try to make sure that thing that they're unable to ex to go through and pull out any kind of unencrypted data, but you have to be prepared to just shut down re-image and, and then re-educate and educate the folks who are involved. So just to make sure that you're, you're prepared to, to be able to continue on, um, that your continuity business without, without, without having to go through and pay the ransom, and be blunt. By the time, yeah, you know, I would rather go through. I, I have much more. No matter what, even if you pay the ransom, you're still going to have to reimage and rebuild everything from scratch. So it's one of those that, yeah, you know, it's, it's just best to be prepared to be able to do that if necessary. Yeah, absolutely. That, that makes sense. Uh, you know, inter interesting question, right? You you said that. You know, you said that you guys had contacted the FBI, right? You you had you know oh, yeah. guy, you were the day, day zero attack, and 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 for somebody who's not a security expert, right? I you know um, you know as I as I think about as I think about companies working with the FBI, right? I always think about like you know like a, a Boeing or a Lockheed Martin, right? You know one of these you know one of these you know defense agencies working with the FBI to do that. So I, I'm curious, Brian, right? Is you know uh, when you think about when you think about ransomware prevention and data security, right? Um, give you an example, you know, Kaiser and Boeing are, are, are the same size. They, they both have 80 billion in revenues a year. Um, do you think they make similar investments in, you know, in, in cyber security technology or? I think a lot, uh, unfortunately, I don't think they do. Uh, one of one of the challenges with with healthcare um, healthcare IT is uh, Becker Hospital Review recently came through um, and found that what they what they found is that hospital groups will spend about five percent of their IT budgets on cybersecurity. That goes through and work ranks works out to a about a 50% increase for mo a lot of other organizations. Most other organizations are 7.3%. Um, other industries which have 
budgetary challenges and they and such are over six percent. So even though healthcare, it's interesting because healthcare also they found when you're looking at the dark web, because people can not only steal the the employee the the the, um, the passenger the patient information, they can go through and and use that to go through and try to get the ransom from the, the groups. But there have been cases where they're trying to get that to go through and extort that from the individual patients who want to keep that secure. That secures. I mean, we have to be really careful with our data to make sure it doesn't get out. It's incredibly value. It's valuable. I kind of like, it, it reminds me of the Willie Sutton, the quote attributed to Willie Sutton when they asked him, why did he rob banks? He's like, well, that's where the money is. And <laughs> when, when we're talking about healthcare, to be blunt on the dark web, that's where the money is. Yet we have a lower per, and over eighty. They found uh, the last report from the the uh, from the the, sur the survey. The I always blink. I, DBIR the data breach investigation report. I have it right right here because um, once it comes out, I'm always going through it. But they found that uh, eighty eight percent of attackers for healthcare are financially motivated. So yeah, yeah. there's a there's a, there's a huge pers there's a huge desirability within to get the hospital data, especially provider data. So we're, you know, prov Providence is, is most at risk. Um, I can't release our information, but I, you know, like I said, what I can do through and do is mention, like I said, the best, the, the, re the Garrity, or I'm sorry, the Becker Hospital Review finding that, yeah, like I said, unfortunately, even though we're so heavily targeted, we, we just don't spend as much as other industries on, on IT security, which Hopefully, you know, I know where I'm at. We've been really increasing that number and we've been taking some, making some really, we've genuinely been making some really good strides on, on doing a lot of things better. And luckily we started that just before the, um, some of the Providence, I'm sorry, some of the, uh, the, the Providence facility had, we had test case zero for COVID in the U.S. And luckily we had just changed our, in, our um, employee VPN, a remote connectivity model just before that. So we had that all set to go. We already had a lot of the, uh, a lot of um, telehealth in place. We increased yeah. our telehealth presence or usage by over a thousand percent in less than two weeks. <laughs> uh, but a lot of it, luckily we had started taking some steps a little over a year ago to really make things improve. And the, the timing worked, like I said, that was very opportune for us so that we were able to really uh, much more efficiently adjust to a lot of these changes where, you know, we went from less than 10% of our non-clinical workers working from home to essentially 100% in less than two weeks. Yeah, no, that's, it, it's amazing what, what, what your, uh, your system and, and, and what other systems have, have done to adapt around the country to the, the kind of new normal. Uh, you, you mentioned something about just, you know, sometimes you just got to lock it, you know, down and, and go to downtime. And, you know, this question is for uh, uh, Richard, Richard M, you know, is, you know, when we, when we think about downtime, right, that there's, there's a cost associated with it, but, you know, maybe can you describe, you know, you know, how, how you would define kind of system downtime and then uh, the associated cost with that? Yeah, absolutely. So almost all cyber policies now include what's referred to as business interruption coverage. Yeah. That kicks in when you have an event that impacts your ability to do business. <clears throat> it actually comes in two flavors, one of which is to do with a security failure. So ransomware would be a classic example of a security mm -hmm. failure. There's also one though, uh, which is far less under, uh, known and understood, which is system failure. So something just goes wrong. So what, what is business interruption coverage? It's the difference between the uh, net profit um, and continuing overheads that you would have uh, earned if the uh, system hadn't been impacted versus the actual net profit and continuing overheads that you had um, with the incident in mind. There's a third bucket there as well called extra expenses, which covers additional costs you incur to get yourselves up and running. So, the, so obvious examples might be paying overtime to technology staff to rebuild systems, the cost of bringing in vendors to help you with that process. Um, it, 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 it's, a, it's an idea that's basically been copied from the property insurance world where business interruption has existed for forever, um, pretty much. <clears throat> so, so those two different types of business interruption insurance, you've got the security failure and the system failure, 
um, can really help alleviate the, the, the overarching problem with system downtime, which is essentially the loss of revenue to the organization, um, which would be using to, to cover your normal overheads uh, and expenses, plus the additional cost you're incurring to try and get yourselves up and running. Um, in, in the event of an attack, there are a bunch of other coverages as well that would normally also come into play. So whilst we're talking about ransomware here, we've already said a couple of different times that it's common for ransomware to, to be the final stages of a, of a data exfiltration. So all cyber policies include within them responses to, to, to data exfiltration processes. So um, it covers the cost of a, a law firm, normally referred to as a breach coach, that works with you on what your legal responsibilities are for the loss of the data. It covers the forensics involved in figuring out what was lost, how it was lost. Um, if you go into the notification stage, it covers the notification costs um, to the individuals you have to notify, as well as credit monitoring and a bunch of other costs there. Uh, it also includes public relations. Um, and then the knock-on effect from, from all of these will be uh, usually class action lawsuits and very often regulatory investigations. And both of those, which you can call liability coverages, are also covered by the policies, including fines levied by um, OCR after their investigations. So, so there's a lot of coverage inside a <laughs> cyber policy. Yeah, no, it, it, it's starting to sound like the, 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 the ransom might be small peanuts, right? <laughs> Compared to, <laughs> to, all the, to all the downstream costs, right? Uh, yes. It, it, it's interesting, right? And as we're talking about a ransom, you know, um, kind of a follow-up question to that might be, you know, any idea on how, um, you know, hackers price, right? Like how do they know what to ask for, right? On a ransom perspective. Yeah, I'm, so, so, I'm curious if there's a, is, is a fair market value on that, right? If you could, if you could look it up and then um, in the event that an organization has to pay it, right? Like UCSF just paid, you know, 1.1 million, uh, 1.1 million dollar ransom. Like yeah. how is it paid? So, so up until probably about a year ago, most ransomware attacks were pretty generic in nature. So the amount yeah. of money being asked for didn't really bear that much relationship to the entity that was attacked. Um, however, their business model has changed. And, and what we're seeing now is a lot of research into the organizations that they're attacking to understand their revenue bases, what they can likely afford. Um, and coupled with that, we, we talked about the fact that um, ransomware attacks often come from phishing. That investigation is giving them the ability to spear fish as opposed to fish to get results on this. And the two things combined mean that we're seeing significant increases in the amount of uh, ransom that's being demanded for organizations. And it's clearly, clearly correlated to the size of the organizations. <clears throat> um, we, we've seen two, 300% increase over the last year. In, in the average ransom demand based on the fact that they're doing research. So from a practical perspective, most cyber policies, the, the extortion um, or the ransomware payment is what's known as an indemnification coverage. So what that actually means practically is that the insured, the hospital, the provider has to pay the ransom and the insurance company then reimburses them. Um, not many companies or entities have $1.8, $2 million lying around in cash. So the, the workaround for that is that the forensics firms that hold the Bitcoin wallets will arrange a short-term loan, which is essentially guaranteed by the insurance policy, allowing the healthcare organization to make the payment and then get reimbursed by the insurer. Um, there are a few policies that are, in fact, pay on behalf, meaning they would pay the ransomware for you. Um, but, but that's not terribly common. But it's much more common for it to be this, the, the, the indemnity basis. Got it. Kind of makes sense. You know, and, and, and I think the, the last question on, on, on ransomware, um, and, and, and I'm open it up to the, the panelists. And um, you mentioned the business case, right? Uh, that 
that indicates to me that there there's a business or an enterprise of of, of people behind this or entities behind this right yep. um we you know the the movies always like to show uh you know a a, a single genius hacker in, in inside a a rent a van right <laughs> in, in in front of the facility doing something but what it's seeming like is more and more that um you know th these are either sophisticated organizations or or even you know uh countries right that, that's kind yeah. of what we're hearing I, I i'm just curious um you know if one of you could comment on you know who you know when it comes to ransomware right where are they coming from like where are these you know hacker groups coming from and and, and what do they typically look like or how are they organized i think a lot of them are coming from eastern europe to be honest with you i mean the ransom ransom the ransom gangs are essentially a global phenomenon but the vast yeah. if you look at it by volume it's coming from Eastern Europe, from the former Soviet uh, republics. Um, they are extremely well organized. This is organized crime. The Russian mob, um, the Russian business network is, you know, one part of that. Um, and this particular group are even quoted on the Russian stock exchange. They are heavily organized. They yeah. have to go to work in their Mercedes and their BMWs wearing suits. They kiss their wife and, wife and kids goodbye in the morning, go to work, hack, extort, hold uh, companies and individuals to ransom uh, for millions of dollars at, at many times, cause distress, interruption to business services. Um, and they have their services um, demarked along uh, different lines of expertise. So you have one group that specializes in exploits, one group that specializes in, in infiltration, one that specializes in exfiltration, one that you know, uh, cleans, the, uh, cleans the money, launders the money, um, they are extremely well organized. This is, as you say, this is a business. Um, and I wish that we in the healthcare space look at the cybersecurity threats as a business as well. Back to Brian and Richard's point here, that, you know, we look at the potential, the true potential cost of loss, not just, you know, the fact that we've got cyber insurance against something, but the impact to patients, uh, the patient safety issues, the inter the damage to our reputations, and we perform a quantitative risk analysis of what are the full impacts of us not spending sufficiently on cybersecurity or putting in place the types of controls and measures that we need to protect patients from attack, right? Uh, not just patient data, but patients themselves as we move towards a digitally connected um, healthcare IoT environment where you know patients Devices attached to patients could be hacked and hold patients to ransom, not just the data um, at their disposal. We're in, a, we're in a, the cusp of a, of a new era, and I think we need to look very carefully at this escalation of ransomware attack and look at what we can do as nations to, you know, to kill off this industry. I, I'm a firm believer that we should probably make it illegal to pay ransomware payments at all um, throughout the, uh, the Western world in order to kill the market. To be honest, if you know senior executives of, all, of any organization haven't got their security incident response, their business continuity, disaster recovery capabilities in place today, after five years of ransomware, then you know they need to go and retire and be replaced with someone who can do that job, right? This is not a problem that is gonna go away. Um, it's actually being uh, magnified by the profits that can be made by our inability to prepare for such things. And I'm glad that Richard brought up the, the level of organization that they have in these other in these other countries because it's interesting because we think of a lot of the hacking laws that exist here, but in Russia, it is not against the law to hack anything outside of the country. There are no laws against it. Inside of Russia, you don't, you very seldom see people inside of Russia hacking inside of Russia, but outside there is like, yeah, there simply are no laws. These are jobs that people have. Um, but similarly, we, I think we need to look at the, the, the breadth of attacks that are happening right now, because uh, it's not just that I know right now there have been multiple, um, multiple releases or attacks that have been occurring at the nation state level. So we're, we do a lot, a lot of hospitals have research areas and the, the feds have come out and basically stated that everybody who, every, every hospital group, every research group that is involved in any type of COVID research, COVID treatment, COVID, so essentially most health care organizations should assume that they are going to be attacked by every nation state 
actor that has a, um, a cybersecurity division um, to try and, and gather research. So it's, there, there are a lot of nation states. It's not just the hackers that are coming, going through and doing this. Also, we have to be, we understand it's not just the patients. Over 50% of the compromises for hospitals have involved employee data. It's not, have not, have been involving private information, not patient healthcare. So uh, when, for all of us who work in the, the healthcare industry, when we're protecting private data and, 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 and what we would consider uh, regulated data, including pay, personally identifiable information, we are protecting ourselves even more than we're protecting our patients when we go through and do this. Um, and when you look at the the fact that this is just a job for some folks, it's it's interesting. Like, in you know, I'm, I know that the NS. I'm, I shouldn't say no. I am confident that the NSA will go through and look through at things for uh, in other areas, but similarly, so do other countries. So, for example, uh, Unit Six One Three Nine Eight in the People's Liberation Army. They 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 have a lot of cybersecurity activity that goes on. I find it interesting that they're not at the political headquarters of the country. They're in Shanghai, which is the financial headquarters. So just observation on my part, part I, I find interesting. But in looking at that, I mean, it's a nine to five job. You, you see, even though there are a certain number of things that are scripted and run all the time, yeah, at a certain time at nine o'clock in the morning, local time, things pick up, ramp up. And then at five o'clock, things start winding down a little bit. But one of the challenges is that a lot of these hacker collectives, as well as individuals, even if they're financially motivated, they're they're just going to keep trying item out thing item task after task to try and see what gets in. Um, the tr problem with nation states, if you're a military actor, so if you are uh, if you are a military per, uh, member and your commanding officer says, do this, do X, do whatever this attack is, until I tell you to stop, it's relentless. They do not stop. It just keeps going until they're tasked with something else. So even though we're talking about a lot of the, the criminal, or, there's criminal organizations that are trying to do the, um, the ransomware, there are also some nation states which are involved in ransomware and other nation state attacks where they're looking for research or gathering data um, for a variety of reasons. So from a healthcare perspective, I, you know, we're, it's unfortunate that you know, we have to, we're essentially hit from pretty almost every direction imaginable, including, well, like I said, nation state states for a variety of purposes. And, and these nation states are extremely well funded with extremely good tools, right? I've, I've been an expert witness in some of the biggest healthcare breaches around the world. Um, and the tools that these guys have at their disposal are phenomenal, right? They're things the NSA has never come across, right? Uh, and as, as Brian said, I mean, it's not just APT1, uh, you know, to quote Mandian's term for uh, this particular PLA group, but there are lots and lots of APT groups, uh, particularly in China, that are focused on the theft of intellectual property. And this is a full-time job for People's Liberation Army cybersecurity warriors uh, that number in the tens or hundreds of thousands of employees uh, that just hack all day long in the attempt to steal intellectual property. If we look at you know, any research hospital situational threat board right now, you will see that the number of connections originating in China dominates the attack, the attack board, right? Um, there are others that are, are at play, the Russians, the North Koreans, the Iranians, uh, but if from a healthcare perspective around the theft of intellectual property, China is by and far the biggest player in this space. So we've got some geopolitical issues here around the protection of um, intellectual property and around stopping this, you know, hybrid cyber warfare that is that is very quickly evolving here. Yeah, th thanks for that. No, that's uh, that's fascinating. I, I didn't realize. Uh, I, I guess crime can be business, right? Uh, yeah, nine to five. Um, you know, it's interesting, right? As, as as we think about as we think about, you know. At the end of the day, right, there's reporting the ransom, but at the, when there's a ransom that's affecting a patient, right, ultimately folks are, you know, and, and, and me as a patient, as, you know, as a, you know, as a husband and a father, I'm, you know, I'm worried about, you know, what happens to that health data, right? And, and it, it's interesting, right? So, the, you know, basically my understanding, right, is that, you know, a credit card on the black market is, is worth a dollar, right? Uh, but, but getting, you know, 
you know, getting someone's actually health record, right, on the black markets can range anywhere from, you know, 50, right, to, to $1,000. We're talking 50 or 1,000 times, right? And I think it was, it was even recently that uh, Gary Gooded over at uh, Seattle Children's uh, w was quoted in the, um, you know, quoted, in, I think, in USA Today that's saying, you know, they, since the pandemic has started, right, they've actually seen um, attacks on their system double, Right, they, and they, they describe that, you know, how, how newborn and to toddler data is especially valuable because, you know, hackers can get it and they don't got to use it right away. They can they can use it in ten years. They can use it in twelve years. Right? They can just you know hang, hang on to it. So, uh, Brian, I wanted to ask you, you know, as, as you think about the, the the pandemic, right? You know, in general, right? You know, how is it affecting your systems? Have you seen an uptick and you know and and attacks or or spear phishing attempts? We've seen more of an evolution of attacks. So okay. yes, there's been an increase, yeah. uh, but the the attacks have gotten far more complex. And yeah. my perspective, like you were mentioning, there are people young getting the like for Seattle Children's or any children's hospital. Yeah, getting the the data for young people is especially valuable because it it it's so long lived. Yeah, it's got um, shelf life. Yeah. Yep. And then the, for other folks there, like I said, there are a lot of, of benefits to that, but what I think that there are a lot of different groups who have just a few little, just new things kind of waiting in the wings. Everybody has their product. These are organizations, these are businesses, and they have new products that are just kind of waiting for release. I, my perspective is that the, with everything going on with the, the pandemic, I think this was their chance to release their newest products to go through and try to um, gather more data and to be more successful because they knew everybody like we're not we're not us, we're not alone. I mean, so many organizations have people. Everybody working from home. They're disrupted. Um, right now, we're working on trying to secure people's machines on their home networks. Uh, there are challenges that we're finding where if somebody doesn't have their router, their home internet device set up correctly and it allows people to come in. I mean, there are a lot of different types of attacks. So I think that that has definitely led to an, inc an increase from that perspective. Mm -hmm. However, like I said, the, 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 what we've seen is definitely a shifting in the types of attacks. So they're focused more on things that are related to COVID. Um, there's been an uptake in nation state uh, attacks that have, that's been found for gathering the data, the intellectual property. Um, but like I said, it's, it kind of comes down to the, when I mentioned we found one type of attack that we could tell this was based on something that had happened previously. And we actually notified the authorities and were involved in a meeting with multiple field offices describing what we found and providing some of the, the logs and some information um, because, to, because we found that they, they really were taking certain things up to the next level. Um, one of the other challenges though is we have to be, like anything, you have to be very careful with what's shared with um, with law enforcement, because like anything, we we have to be careful of our our uh, private regulated data from everybody. And so, yeah, so yes, we've we're we tr we're very proactive in trying to share what information we can. Um, but it's one of those challenges. You have to be careful. Like you have to be careful not to share things that are, you know, just because you're sharing it with law enforcement doesn't mean you can legally share anything. There's a process to go through. Mm -hmm before sharing anything like that. Um, but like I said, it is, I think it is important to go through and try to find or groups that to work with to try and at least share the information as far as what types of attacks are occurring, how they're changing, how they're involving, and what can be done to, to go through and make them better. The one piece of advice I will give to anybody, um, when I started talking with the person, I was talking to our local field agent um, for the Seattle office and he and I were both presenting at a, at a conference. So, I mean, I knew it was him. He, I you know, got his, his contact information. But if ever anybody reaches out to you, to anybody here and says that they're from any law enforcement organization, first thing to do is confirm where they're calling, who, you know, who they are, where, what group they're calling from, and then, hang up and call that don't ask them for the phone number 
call that organization, look up the phone number for the Seattle field office yeah. or something and ask for that individual. So that's what I was talking to because, and he, yeah, you know, that's one of the things he mentioned is, you know, it's, it's sometimes very difficult for the, for law enforcement to be involved in these types yeah. of things because just getting engaged without putting people at risk. But he did mention when he'll tell people, okay, please make sure you call back the Seattle field office because he'll try to set that up from the beginning. He said the very first, he's like, he even asked, he's like, and what's the first question everybody asks? Oh yeah. What's your phone number? So yeah. <laughs> um, there is a, de uh, there are definitely some good ways to involve them. But the other thing is I would recommend is folks um, at least find out who the local uh, contact, find out the contact for your local field office and, and provide them some with some information because one of the biggest challenges that is when the, if somebody, if the FBI detects something or they, or a federal organization detects something, they're required to notify the organization, uh, the business. And one of the biggest, like, you know, the, the, our, the local field agent, he mentioned he has had to literally go to an office, walk into a reception desk and show his credentials and say, who can I talk to? Because they, a lot of times they have no idea who to even contact. So what's a good idea is for your cyber scare, your cyber response folks to reach out to the, your, your field office, let them know who you are, who to contact. That way, if there is ever anything that is detected, they can go through and contact you much more because time is critical in those cases. And that'll make it much easier for them to be able to reach out, contact the right people and, and get a proper response started quickly. Yeah, no, that, that's great. That's great advice. And uh, I definitely like the idea of uh, confirming and calling them back. I think I could deploy that in, in, in several other areas uh, in, in professional and, and personal life. <laughs> yeah, a little social engineering, perhaps. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Richard M or R Richard S, right? Um, in, any, any uptick and when you look at it across your, your, your client board, right? Uh, anything to add, you know, related to, you know, how you think that the pandemic is either affecting um, different types of attacks, right? Which Brian was talking about, or just in, in maybe a general uptick in, in, in types of claims that you're seeing, uh, Richard M. So uh, from an insurance perspective, there's definitely a lot of anecdotal commentary around the number of attacks yeah. increasing. And with the number of attacks increasing, you know, the, if the success rate stays the same, the, the number of successful attacks increases. What I can't give you at the moment is any data about that. We're still too early in the process for data yeah. to have actually been collected. But um, most insurers are seeing what they believe is to be relatively uh, significant increases in, in the number of attacks and, their, and as a corollary, the, the number of successful infiltrations. You know, yeah, thanks for that. Go ahead. I was going to say, you know, according to um, uh, Department of Health and Human Services, in the first six months of the year, there was a 50% increase in the previous year in attacks. If we look at attacks against the World Health Organization, that went up 500%. Um, if we look at other statistics from the FBI, from InfraGuard, from, from other uh, organizations, this is all a dramatic uptick. So cyber criminals are aware that our guards are down. The attack surface is much, much broader than it has been in the past since we're all working from home today. Um, and that, uh, you know, we are distracted by COVID, right? I mean, we have gone, for, as security leaders, we've gone from protecting one or two sites of 20,000 people to 20,000 individual sites as individuals work from home, you know, connecting from their home offices over their home internet connection, um, you know, sharing that connection perhaps with their gamer children or their social media addicted other family members. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, they're using a $50 uh, firewall router, perhaps that the firmware has never been updated in the 10 years they've owned it. Um, and the default password's never changed, right? So we, we've got a very different attack surface than we had six months ago when we were all working in offices. Um, and, and, you know, and this is, this is very prevalent to, uh, or very important, to attack us because hey, it's you know it's like salmon season for bears, right? As the salmon swim up <laughs> up uh, uh, up river, the bears gorge mm -hmm. themselves, and I think this is what um, what is happening amongst the uh, cyber criminal community. And then when you combine that with the targeted nation state attacks against research into COVID, so that you know their country's pharmaceutical organisations can be the first to market with whatever, you know, drug comes out to inoculate us all against, you know, this uh, latest coronavirus, 
then uh, you know you've got you know you've got a tax coming at you from multiple different directions um, and and uh, from multiple different actors. And one, getting back to one of the things that the initial questions, what can be done to help with that? One of the things that we also are doing when you're talking about the, you know, rather than one place with 20,000 having 20,000. So yeah, when you're talking about tens of thousands or over 100,000 remote workers, um, setting up, we going through and changing your remote access approach so that instead of a system going over the internet and then getting just openly and then getting to a, a destination on your, your, uh, in your environment, in your data center or wherever in the cloud, where it goes to and does the authentication. Um, one of the, the thing, the changes that we've made is setting up a proxy in the cloud so that for work, for workstations, as soon as it's an always on solution. So as soon as that workstation gets online, it, essentially locks out any communications until it gets to a VPN that's established with a proxy that's in the cloud. And then that proxy in the, the cloud goes through a security device, goes through and is integrated with the firewall and connects to something on-prem. So there there are some ways of trying to go through and address this. And I just wanted, since we were talking earlier on, you know, one of the other questions was, what can people do that? That is something that is more important, more more important now than it was six months ago by a significant margin. Yeah, I, I would agree with you, but I think we've got, I, I've seen a, a prevalence of split tunneling as hospitals have um, been challenged by their VPN licensing or their like, the load on their VPN concentrators. And I know that there's been a lot of remedial work done to kind of up licensing to replace hardware um, over the last few months. But there was definitely a period there where users were attaching to uh, using split tunneling to hospital resources, right? Yep. We've got another issue where, you know, there wasn't, you couldn't get a laptop for love or money back in, in March, right? When everyone started working from home. So hospitals were faced with some pretty tough challenges. Do we allow people to use their own machines from home, right? Do we push down whatever we can in terms of endpoint protection? Um, as you mentioned, Brian, you know, around, making sure that that machine is compliant before attaching to the network um, uh, until such times that we can put a, uh, a managed endpoint um, out with users. And I think there's still some cleanup that needs to happen mm -hmm. if, if we look particularly at, uh, across the smaller providers um, in the rural settings that just don't have the resources or the capability to rapidly uh, deal with an expanded distributed workforce at the same time that they've uh, had to rapidly adopt telehealth and telemedicine and other um, digitalization um, in order to stay in business. Yep, and to, when you're talking about split tunneling, um, luckily I had uh, in the, as soon as we started this, I just made, it was like, nope, full tunnel, always on full tunnel. Because we went from not from allowing the user to and establish the VPN connection to and split tunneling to just nope, full tunnel, always on and, the, yeah, the, whichever solution you go with, yes, there are some routing challenges. There are things to get through, but you know, it's just at this point, it's critical to make sure that we go to you know to go down uh, that path and lock things down as much as possible. Agreed. Yeah, no, that's you're absolutely right. And and what 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 I frequently hear from from uh, health system CIOs um, is that the, that staff that they've sent home right um, to to work remotely. Uh, they don't have any intentions on bringing them back, uh, right? So kind of there's going to be, I, we're also seeing this from, from large companies like Amazon or even I think it was Twitter that recently announced that they'll allow their remote employees to work at home indefinitely, um, right? As they start to look at the, the cost benefit analysis of, 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 of site shifting and cost shifting at home. As, as we think about that, and, um, and this question is for Richard, right? Uh, Richard M, you know, any, any impacts or policy updates, you know, folks need to think about, right? If, if, if they're going to move several thousand of their, their staff remotely, um, you know, what should they be looking at in their policy or, you know, you know, if they pick up the phone and call you, what should they be asking about? So, so I get the, the, the good news um, is that almost all cyber policies, mm -hmm. the, um, the, the, the security that your information you're providing is understood to be a snapshot in time and the security will evolve. So I'm not aware of any cyber insurers 
who have tried to modify or alter terms because all of a sudden there's, there's a multiple of the individuals working from home. That just hasn't happened. Now, having said that, um, as, as our accounts come up for renewal, the insurers are asking a lot of questions around just how that went, how it's happened. They're really interested um, because of ransomware and backup processes and procedures, as well as network segmentation. So they are asking quite detailed questions around that, but they're doing it at renewal, which is the good, which is the good news for, for the uh, buyer. So, so you're, you're not having to respond to the insurance part of the question as you're also trying to deal with these very challenging technology issues. Good. Well, thank you so much for that. Um, gentlemen, and we, uh, we only have a, a few minutes left. So to, to that end, I think we'll have to wait uh, to, to cover the exciting topic of business associate agreements till, till, till next time. Um, but to that end, uh, I, I want to thank you. Um, thank you uh, to my panelists for joining me today and uh, really discussing about the impacts that health systems are, are you know, or what we're seeing, how it's impacted them financially and, and, and some of the technical capabilities that, that health systems are, are either needing to purchase or, uh, or, or build, right, in order to protect themselves. And um, what's interesting for me is it sounds like that uh, the, the, this, isn't, this isn't just going to go away, right, in, in the summer like, um, like other things, right? Do we, we would expect that this to the, the, this type of attacks the, and these uh, the, these types of bad actors to only uh, increase uh, year over year. Um, and and again, so making sure that we have uh, the, the technical uh, resources in place, uh, you know, are, are quite important. Uh, to that end, um, thank you everyone for for joining today. Um, as we end this survey, uh, you should have a second dialogue box open up. Uh, it is a safe link. It is from me. Uh, <laughs> it, is a, it is a survey. Uh, we'd ask you to uh, take time to take a survey um, and let us know what you think about the topics, as well as um, if you're interested, again, in, in being a panelist or hearing about um, uh, ways that you can get more involved with the HIMSS chapter, please fill out that survey and uh, one of the board members or committee members will, will be in touch. But again, thank you so much to our panelists today. And uh, that concludes our August member meetup. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks to everyone who tuned in. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.